the sun it would it would be an understatement to say that the sun isn't the life force for the earth it provides us with so much different types of energy it gives plants the life that it needs it gives the warmth that makes life necessary and possible it does let go of a lot of different things a lot of lots and lots of energy and one form of it is through electromagnetic waves which has a very very large span it could be waves can be these waves these waves of energy can be ten th tens of thousands of kilometers long which is longer than the diameter of the earth or it could be even smaller or as about as small as a nuclei of it uh, of not of a an atom and not just a cell Within this giant array of light, we really just see 300 nanometers of it. Within that 300 nanometers is your different types, the colors of the rainbow. This light comes down, it gets absorbed and reflected. And the light that's reflected off is what we perceive. So a, a, a green leaf is light, green light being reflected off back at, at us. So it's really amazing that just this small sliver is sensed by our eyes and it does make sense because the atmosphere really doesn't let much in but in this little spot right here it lets in a lot in it lets in a lot so what we're going to be talking about this and the next video about vision is we will be discussing how the eye works, the different parts of the eye, and how the eye, all these parts work to come together for us to be able to see. So I would recommend going ahead and memorizing this picture. This is also something that you'll want to go ahead and reflect back on, that you can go ahead and trace light as it goes through the varying parts and pieces of the eye. First off, let's go ahead and I should mention that there are three layers or three tunicas that they're called. The, there's a fibrous tunica, there is a vascular tunica, and then there's the tunica associated with the retina, the part of the eye that actually sees and senses that light. Now this fibrous tunic, it's the white of the eye or the sclera. So if you open up your eyes really wide and you look around and you see that white stuff, this is sclera. This is dense irregular connective tissue. That's not you don't really need to know that it's dense irregular connective tissue. It just should sort of make sense to you because that dense irregular connective tissue, it's it's thick. It's not very pliable. It stay it keeps its shape, which is good because if you remember, you got all those extrinsic muscle muscles hanging on to it and moving it around. So you gotta have that density. And those of you that have dissected an, a cow's eye or what have you in in whether in high school or in college or whatever. You, will, you can attest that this stuff is pretty strong. It's darn strong. You can stick a scalpel to it and it, it, it's not going to cut very easily. Continuing or a part of that sclera is something called the cornea. It's not white. It's very, very clear. This is composed of several layers of tissue. The inner layer is connective and the outer layer is a epithelial tissue, which gets its oxygen from the air. It, it kind of makes sense that it can't really get much of its nutrients because a lot of that vascular tissue, if it crept up into the cornea, you'd, your cornea would become opaque and you would not be able to see anymore. The other nutrients such as sugars and all that stuff to help maintain that tissue comes in via this liquid back here, which we will talk about here shortly. Now, LASIK, this is FYI, sorry for the picture, but pretty much what happens here is we, they peel away the outer layer, that epithelial tissue, and then they take a laser and clear out some of this connective tissue that's sandwiched in between and reshape it so that light gets distributed in a better way. That flap gets replaced. In about a week, it's all healed up and you can go bumping along the road. Before that, I would highly recommend not going down a four by uh, a dirt road or anything or riding any amusement rides you got to let that thing heal now we're done with the, the fibrous layer let's move on to the vascular layer this is the part that actually 
provides the food and nutrients that the other layers need. If we were to pop up a picture, this is going to be the back of the eye. I'm looking through the pupil, that little black spot on the eye, and I'm looking into the back. This red stuff right here are all blood and arteries and veins. You'll notice that it's radiating out from this optic disc, it's called. This is also where your optic nerve is coming in. That means that all your neurons that are associated with sight are coming out from right here and interacting at different points and places. This is a picture of, this is an FYI, a picture of something else that really stresses the importance of the choroid. This right here on the left is an albino individual's view of the back of the eye, and this is a normal view. You'll notice that it is browner compared to this one. Mm -hmm. What's happening is that that choroid has melanin in it. That melanin absorbs extra light. If you didn't get that light absorbed, that can bounce back and hit that retina again, and it's a very unpleasant, very blurry experience. That is why a lot of albinos are wearing shades even inside. Now, I had mentioned that there was this liquid flowing around inside this chamber earlier about the, when I was talking about the cornea. I put it here because this is actually a continuation of your choroid. That choroid comes up and becomes feeds that blood and all that stuff into the ciliary body, the ciliary process. That ciliary process is connected to a lens that will distort the light, which we'll talk about later. But it also, this choroid process releases liquid out into this anterior chamber and this lake liquid or anterior cavity which into the posterior chamber with this liquid is called aqueous humor aqueous because it's really quite liquid like it's fluid it'll flow out from behind the posterior chamber through the pupil remember that little black spot smack dab in the middle of the eye that's called a pupil and out into the anterior chamber and then it's going to get reabsorbed into this little scleral venous sinus. This is an FYI, you don't really need to know it. Glaucoma, glaucoma is the buildup of this liquid. And usually it's indicative that you have something going on wrong with your blood vessels. You have something going wrong with your veins. It's getting a buildup. Glaucoma is the buildup of this aqueous humor in this chamber. And too much of that buildup can be detrimental to the health of your eye because you're delaying the nutrients that you need for it. It could build up a plaque along the cornea. It could dull the lens. It could do a lot of bad things to you that would destroy your ability to see or hamper your ability to see. So how we check for that, it's if those of you that are unlucky like me that have to go see an ophthalmologist every so often, every year, they do a little puff of air on the front of your eye they do, and it's annoying and I don't like it very much, but what they're doing is they're pushing, putting pressure on that cornea and seeing how much that cornea bends. If it bends to a normal degree, then yeah, you don't have glaucoma. If it doesn't bend at all, it means that there's a lot of pressure building up back here and you probably have the first signs of glaucoma. One last structure to look at in this anterior cavity is this iris. It's a type of muscle and it's pigmented or not pigmented. Um, if it's pigmented, it could be green or brown. If it lacks pigment, it's blue. So an albino individual will have blue eyes, just like our alligator friends have that nice blue eyes that are albino. Something about this iris is if you are in a parasympathetic state or you're in a really really bright room your iris is there to help decrease the amount of light that's making it back to the retina because if you don't it's very irritating and very uncomfortable if you're in a sympathetic response or in dim light it's going to dilate and this is what crack cocaine does as well it dilates the pupil that way, not for crack cocaine, which I should have held off on that one, but the sympathetic nervous system, you're taking in the information that you need to be able to run away or fight. 
Finally, we're down to the last layer, the retina. The retina is the really thin, thin layer on the top of your choroid. It is the stuff that you can truly see. And a neurologist will often look into the eyeball to see if there's any type of issues. If you have multiple sclerosis, they're going to take a look to see inside here to see if there's any plaque buildups or anything. Because it's easy, easy to see the nerves and the blood and all that stuff in this place. Those nerves and those blood vessels are exposed. Now, some extremely important points to point out here. First off is this optic disc. This optic disc, again, that's your optic nerve coming in as long with that optic nerve is coming in with this blood that feeds into the choroid. You also have this really, really dark spot right here. This is where you're going to focus your light on. If you're remembering back to chapter 14, where we're talking about the reflexes that if you hear something in the periphery, or if you see something run past in the periphery, you turn and look really quick. That's because you want that light or that object to be centered onto your macula lutea, your fovea centralis. Because that is where the finest image you can develop can come from. In this location is where the cone cells are. We need to talk. So there's two different types of cones really quick before I move on. There's a rod and then there's a cone. A rod senses black and white, while cones sense color, all the different colors of the rainbow. Rods aren't very crisp in their image. They don't really provide really clean, perfectly formed lines for you. They're kind of blurry. But they sure do help you see at night because they are extremely photosensitive, meaning that the, if too much light gets on them, they shut off or shut down or bleach is the appropriate term for this, surprisingly. While cones prefer the daytime. They're not as sensitive as that of the rods. These cones are heavily found in the fovea centralis. In fact, they're the only type of sensory cell that is found in the fovea centralis. The rods are not present. So this green, what I'm showing you here is the, the di distribution of these things. Anything that is green indicates the the presence of those, and as they dissipate or disappear, it means that their presence starts disappearing. So for these rods, it's really, really heavy in the periphery, but not so much in the middle, which, if you think about it, that kind of makes sense. If you're wanting to see something going on or you want to catch some type of movement, you want something that is ultra sensitive going on in your periphery, and these rods are great at being extremely sensitive, just like me and my feelings. Now, we have talked about the back of the retina. Remember that that fovea centralis is the point that you want it focused on. I do need to point out one more thing really quick. I want to point out this right here. So we talked about, here's the cornea, here's the aqueous humor, this anterior cavity. Here's the lens that focuses light. We'll talk about that here very shortly. And then there's this back chamber, this posterior cavity that is filled with something called a vitreous humor. It's a very gelatinous mixture. Aqueous humor circulates in about 10 minutes or less. Vitreous humor lasts hours, if not days. It's a very gelatinous stuff. It's just there to hold open the eye as well as have some type of way for the light, some type of liquid or substance for the eye to pass through, or I, my word, the light to pass through. Now, something to note about vision is this. Those of you that have been a mountain biker or are familiar with mountain streams and all that stuff, or if you're, heck, if you're even in, into cooking, you know that light gets bent when it goes from air to water. In a mountain biker, you're warned to before you cross a stream that you need to brace for that this stream is going to be a lot deeper because that light is bent. When you're looking into a pot of water, it looks the water makes it look look like the bottom of that pot is a lot higher than it actually is. That's the, so here's an excellent example of that. So we're looking at 
a straw being placed into some water. You can see that it, once it hits the water, it kind of distorts. But from the side, it looks like this is a disjointed straw. It no longer is connected. This is one straw. There isn't a second straw in there. That light passing through that liquid and then coming back another distorts the light that's in there or changes the path of that light. So it makes it look like it's broken, but it isn't. What, how the, what that all means to us is this. When light passes, starts passing through our liquid, we're going from an air to a, to a cartilage, to a liquid, to another type of cartilage, to another liquid. It's going to get changed. So as soon as it hits that cornea, it starts bending and getting focused. This lens, how it works, it's sort of, it can get pulled or like pulled in separate ways. You see these little lines, these little lines pull on it to allow light to get to focus in different points. That's how, what tells us, gives us our, dis, our ability to focus. If you want to see out in the distance and you're looking at a beautiful, gorgeous uh, mountain scene or uh, over the bayou looking at the alligator coming at you from a ways and you want to get away, or you could be looking nice and close looking at your book or at this slide, in fact, or at this video. That lens is able to change shape in order to help you focus the what you're interested in onto the back of the eye. Now, there is some problems due to the lens. For instance, if the lens is misshaped or if it has an astigmatic, okay, it's like kind of off. It can actually focus the image that you really want nearer to the lens, nearsighted, or farther away than you want, farsighted. It can be corrected with a lens that'll help redirect that line to the appropriate place. Now it hits that lens, it hits that eyeball, it gets past the eyeball, goes to the vitreous humor, hits the retina, and then the information after it's processed, it triggers the neurons, sends them down the optic nerve. Those images need to be sent to the appropriate sides of the brain. Everything in the left view, field of view, has to be transferred over to the right cerebrum. Everything in the right view gets transferred to the opposite side, to the left cerebrum of the occipital lobe. Now, this is achieved via, maybe you should remember it from looking at it when, at our cranial nerves, but there's a, something called an optic chiasm. Chiasm, remember, just means an X or a crossing. So everything that wants to be, needs to be, this, everything in the left field of view needs to be in the right. So what the, the left eyeball sees of this left field of view gets transferred over via the optic chiasm and over into the right, into this right cerebrum, this right occipital lobe. This is the same that holds true for the, the right field of view. When the right eyeball catches some of the right field of view. That information needs to get over to the left cerebrum or you're gonna get some confusing information. And it comes up and gets to the left occipital lobe. So everything in the left field of view gets sent to the right occipital lobe. Everything in, I don't remember what I just said, but the right field of view gets sent to the left occipital lobe. Now, here's one extra little bit of detail. When you get a chance, pull up the slides, take a look at this. But there's some, I want to explain to you about the adaptation to light. I had mentioned that the, remember, Maybe you remember that those rods are extremely sensitive and they bleach and they no longer turn on if there's a lot of light. The same holds true to those cone cells as well. They adapt to light or dark. If it's really, really bright, the brain says, okay, that's enough information. It's either those cones either become bleached or your brain turns them off. If it turns them off, then the colors that aren't being sensed those cones are still being being active. So if you were to look at this after image and then switch over to a white background, all those other neurons, all those other sensory cells that aren't turned off yet, the blue and the yellow are still turned on. So when you flip over, you still see an after image of them. That red is turned off in the background, but that blue isn't. So you actually see the different colors still. You still see the after image, and just, but just in the colors that, or wavelengths that weren't activated. 
We are finishing up on vision here. Let me talk about some of the accessory structures. You got your eyebrows and eyelashes there to make certain that things don't get into them like dust or sweat. You also have your eyelids, which help rehydrate your eyes. You need to keep those eyes nice and hydrated or they can dry out and you can have some really bad issues. You also have the lacrimal apparatus. That's pretty much just a really fancy way of make, making and delivering and getting rid of tears. So you have a lacrimal gland that over the superior lateral aspect of your eye, which will is continually secreting. You have a little bit of look of tears going on in your eyeballs. That's why they're always wet. But when you're crying, it's overproducing. Any tears that are created, whether you're crying or not, do make it into this lacrimal duct down into the nasal cavity where it, most of the time you just swallow it. If you're crying a lot, a lot of this duct is overwhelmed and it can leak out the front. Hence why you get a, a snotty nose when you're having a, a crying episode. With that, that is the end of sight. And we will be talking shortly on another. Have yourselves a wonderful day.